Welcome back. We're going to wrap up deep convolutional neural networks by evaluating our model's accuracy. Last time, we set up the final font recognition model. Now let's see how it does. In this video, we're going to learn how to handle dropouts during training. Then, we'll see what accuracy the model achieved. Finally, we'll visualize the weights to understand what the model learned. Make sure you pick up in your IPython session after training the previous model. Recall that when we trained our model, we used dropout to remove some outputs. While this helps with overfitting, during testing, we want to make sure to use every neuron. This both increases the accuracy and makes sure that we don't forget to evaluate part of the model. And that's why in these highlighted lines we have keep prob is 1.0 to always keep all the neurons. Let's see how the final model did. Just take a look at the training and testing accuracy as usual. The training accuracy here topped 85% and the testing accuracy isn't too far behind. Not too bad. How good a model does depends on how noisy the input data is. If we only have a small amount of information, both in the number of examples and number of parameters or pixels, then we can't expect the model to perform perfectly. In this case, one metric you can apply is how well a human could classify images of a single letter to each of these fonts. Some of the fonts are very distinctive, while others are similar, especially for certain letters. Because this is a novel dataset, there isn't a direct benchmark to compare against. But you can challenge yourself to beat the model presented in this course. If you do so, you might want to reduce the training time. Smaller networks with fewer parameters and simpler computations, of course, will be faster. Alternately, if you start using a GPU, or at least a multi-core CPU, you can get dramatic speedups often 10x or better depending on the hardware. Part of this is parallelism, and part of it is highly efficient, low-level libraries fine-tuned for neural networks. But the easiest thing to do is start simple and work your way up to more complex models, just like you've been doing with this problem. Back to this model. Let's see the confusion matrix. Here, we can see that the model is generally doing a good job on the various classes, Class 1 still isn't perfect, but it's much better than in the previous models. By building up smaller scale features into larger pieces, we finally found some good indicators for the classes. Your images might not look exactly the same. It's possible to get a little unlucky with the results, depending on random initialization of your weights. Let's look at the weights for the 16 features of the first convolutional layer. Because the window size is 3x3, three three, each one is a 3x3 three three matrix. Aha! We can see the weights are definitely pulling out small scale features. You can see certain things like edges being detected, or rounded corners, different things like that. If we redo the model with a larger window, this might be even more apparent. But it's impressive how many features you can spot in just these small patches. Let's also look at the final layer weights, just to see how the different font classes interpret the final densely connected neurons. Each row represents a class, and each column is one of the final hidden layer neurons. Some classes are influenced strongly by certain neurons, while others have minimal effect. And you can see how a given neuron is very important, positively or negatively, for certain classes, while mostly neutral on the others. Note that because we've flattened our convolutions, we don't expect to see obvious structure here. These columns could be in any order and still produce the same results. In this video, we checked out our real, live, and frankly, pretty nice deep convolutional neural network model. In this section, we built up the idea and practice of using convolutional and pooling layers in order to extract small and large-scale features in structured data like images. For many problems, this is among the most powerful types of neural networks. In the next section, we'll look at models with a time component, recurrent neural networks.